Uh, oh, Dr. Bogosh is here. Okay, come on up, Dr. Eisenberg is ID. So clearly we're on the verge of a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> and all the recent, um, and I see it. I, see it. Um, yeah, I just wondering, are the zombies going to be slow old ones or fast runners? Oh, you they're think? slow. They're going to stay slow? We're okay, set. we're set then. Okay, we're good. Perfect. Hey, I, you don't have to call. <laughs> I'm Isaac Bogosh, one of the infectious disease physicians at uh, Toronto General Hospital. I was listening from back there about the nose reductions in the emergency department, and I was one of those nose reductions in the emergency department when I got an elbow on the outdoor ice a couple of years ago. And as you can see, it's amazing. They did a wonderful job. <laughs> wow. Anyways, let's talk about ID in the ED. Uh, there we go. We're not going to mention COVID. We've talked about COVID a million times, so this is a non-COVID ID in the ED talk. A couple of disclosures first. I consult to a couple of places. One's called Blue Dot. It's, uh, it tracks emerging infectious diseases and the NHL Players Association. I'm not going to talk about either of those today. All right, travel. Travel is back. Travel is back big time. We have a lot of people who are flying to various corners of the world and returning uh, to Toronto and to Ontario and to Canada. And of course, they bring with them travel-related infections. So I think it's important to talk about a few travel-related issues that might be relevant to the emergency department. Number one, we got a 44-year-old female. She comes into the ED with a fever. Oh, I think I got a laser here. Nope. Anyways, comes into the ED with a fever. She returned from Southern Africa about eight days ago. She was in, uh, on safari in South Africa, then went to Mozambique, into the beautiful beaches there. Didn't get any pre-travel advice. She's up to date on all her vaccines. She's febrile at 38.2. She appears well. Her platelets are 130. Okay, seen it before. You've probably seen this a million times. Malord, malady, malaria, right? We all know this is burned into our brainstem. Fever in the return travelers, malaria until proven otherwise. We've heard this a million times. We know the reason that it's burned into our brainstem is because malaria can cause significant morbidity and mortality, one of the more common causes of mortality in return travelers. Fever in the return travelers, malaria until proven otherwise, except this person had all the right malaria screens, thick and thin smear, rapid test in the emergency department. Malaria test is negative. Malaria test is negative. Okay, now what? Well. We have an approach to fever in the return traveler, especially in the emergency department. We usually think about three key things. Infections related to travel, infections unrelated to travel, and non-infectious etiologies, okay? Those are the three things to look for. And if you look in the infections related to travel, some of this looks like just this esoteric crap that you'll never ever see in your life. You know, dengue, that's pretty common. Other things, leptospirosis. There's a ton of leptospirosis out there. It's just that our diagnostic tests suck, and by the time lepto is diagnosed, your patient is better or dead. Like, these, we just have very poor <laughs> diagnostics. Rickettsia, what the hell is a rickettsia infection? These are bacterial infections from, from bug bites. They're extraordinarily common. We just don't make these diagnoses, typhoid, etc. So these are things to consider. Now, this person has a negative malaria thick and thin smear. They have a fever, but they look like they're well enough to go home. So, you know, what do you, what do, you do in this situation? They're healthy, they're well, their malaria is negative. Here's the two things, doxycycline and azithromycin. That is the magic combination, doxycycline and azithromycin. Why? You've ordered a bunch of tests. You're not going to get those results back for days, sometimes even weeks. And this buys you time for those tests. And it's going to cover almost, not all, but almost all of the major pathogens. It's going to cover your leptospirosis. It's going to cover your rickettsial infections. It's going to cover typhoid. It's going to cover important gram positives and important gram negatives. One, two punch, winning combination, doxy and azithromycin. This case was pretty interesting. This happened to be African tick bite fever. And you have to look for this little escar, also known as the tache noir. It's, and you think, oh, this is crazy. No one has this. It's a, one of the most common causes of fever that's non-malaria in travelers from Africa. There's another one. And again, you have to look for it. And, and, and I'm not saying everyone in this room has to look for the tache noir to say, aha, this is African tick bite fever. The point is, You've ruled out malaria, you've put them on doxycycline and azithromycin, and you've covered it, and you've covered a bunch of other things that it could be, and this person did just fine because the doxycycline melts this infection away in no time. We love our doxycycline. This is my favorite picture in ID. <laughs> We're nerds. I mean, you guys are <laughs> reducing noses and doing all sorts of things that we get excited about doxycycline. Okay, 
You'll recognize this case because it's basically identical to the last case, except this person came back from India. Okay, 44, returned from India, home for eight days, didn't get any pre-travel advice, had a wonderful time visiting friends and relatives, eating a delicious food, comes back with a fever platelets of 130. Sounds familiar? Malaria test is negative in the emergency department. Sound familiar? What do you do? You know exactly what to do, right? You got to cover your infections related to travel. Think about infections unrelated to travel and non-infectious etiologies. We know what our differential diagnosis is. Different region, maybe some things are higher up or lower on the differential, but the differential is pretty similar. You put her on doxycycline and azithromycin because we know that's going to cover most things. And in this case, you were right because you empirically put this person on doxycycline and azithromycin and this person had typhoid. There is a ton of typhoid in South Asia. Let me say it again for effect. There is a ton of typhoid in South Asia and travelers get it and travelers bring it home, especially travelers that are visiting friends and relatives who often don't seek pre-travel advice. Okay, diversity makes Canada great. This, uh, uh, diversity makes Canada great. We have a very large South Asian population in Canada and many are traveling back to visit friends and relatives and we are seeing typhoid come through the emergency department. The culture for typhoid stinks. I mean, it's, it's only about 60 to 70% sensitive. So a febrile patient where you've ruled out malaria in the emergency department, you know, you put them on your doxycycline and azithromycin, you're covering typhoid as well. Brilliant. You've solved that issue. The cultures may or may not come back positive, but you've solved this issue. There's your azithromycin. You've heard of typhoid Mary. Have you ever heard of typhoid Gary? <laughs> this is real. This is, a. Uh, this guy's on SoundCloud and I don't think I enjoy his music particularly, but if you're interested, that, that, that person exists. Okay, last one. Exact same story, except coming back from Southeast Asia. Okay, returned eight days ago, no pre-travel advice, had a wonderful time on the beaches of Thailand and then in Laos. Malaria is negative, but you know what to do. You put this person on doxycycline and azithromycin, it's gonna cover everything, or almost everything. You've got it covered. Doxy and azithro, you're in good shape. This one, of course, is not a bacterial infection. This person has dengue. The doxy and azithro aren't gonna do anything, but you don't know that in the emergency department. You don't know that in the fog of war. You just know that it could be a bunch of other bacterial things, and it's totally acceptable to put someone on doxy and azithro empirically, even though this ended up being dengue. The take home point here is that dengue is actually a very common infection in travelers. You're definitely seeing it. Yeah, the serology comes back a week or two weeks later, but you're definitely seeing it seeing more. Why? There is a massive resurgence of dengue fever this year. We are seeing Canadians travel almost at pre-pandemic levels, not quite, but there's a huge resurgence of travel and there's big dengue outbreaks everywhere. Thailand, Singapore, all over Southeast Asia, Sudan and many parts of Africa are having huge dengue outbreaks. South America, where Canadians travel, Latin America and the Caribbean, huge dengue outbreaks, you know, Argentina, Peru declares a health emergency, you're gonna see dengue. Whether you think, whether you know it or not, you're definitely gonna be seeing dengue. Think about this in the return travelers. So the take home points for travel. Azithromycin plus doxycycline for malaria negative, non-localizing febrile illness in the emergency department is extraordinarily helpful. You're going to see lots of typhoid from travelers in South Asia and the cultures are not the best. And there's a massive, massive global surge in dengue. Okay, another case. A 24-year-old guy presents to the emergency department, direct quote, Doc, there's a worm coming out of my butt. This is what you get when you invite ID to come and talk. We're gonna talk worms and dengue. Okay, so what's our approach to worm coming out of butt? It's actually pretty easy. <laughs> worm and butt approach, it's either a real worm coming out of a real butt, or it's not a real infection, okay? And under the not a real infection, sometimes objects come out of people's butts that, mis that look like worms. They do. They actually do. It's not a worm. Sometimes it's vegetable matter. Sometimes it's protonaceous material. I don't know what the lab says. I read it and I don't understand it. But sometimes things look like worms. And sometimes it's delusional parasitosis, which again, it's treatable. It's, uh, you can make a diagnosis. You can treat it. But the key point here is that worms come out of butts and they're common, okay? This nice guy's holding up Ascaris lumbricoides. Only a billion people on the planet have this. There's a much longer one. That's a beef tapeworm, Tania sanginata. Not as common, but it happens. It happens. 
But then some people bring in things in containers that didn't come out of their butt, although they said so, right? That's an earthworm. That's an earthworm. <laughs> okay, it happens. You'll see it. I see it. Okay, this looks kind of like a worm. It does. Doesn't that look like a worm? It looks like a worm. It's got the same texture. That's a, that's a bean sprout, okay? <laughs> but it comes out of the butt. So the key here and the take-home point for worms coming out of the butt is that you've got the gift of time, okay? Even if it's a real worm, these are rarely emergencies, and you've got to send that worm or whatever it is to public health. You absolutely have to. The reason is every single thing that happens after that depends on what came out of the butt. If it's a real worm, it's important to know what kind of worm because different worms have different treatments. If it's not a real worm, it's important to note that because we can counsel people that they should chew their bean sprouts or that maybe they have delusional parasitosis, which is a completely different follow-up, okay? The key, though, is that even if you say, I know what this is and I'm gonna treat it and here's some whatever, mabendazole or something in the emergency department, polyparasitism is the rule, not the exception. If you have a worm, chances are you have risk factors for other worms and other parasites, and those need to be identified and treated. So even though you might be treating a worm, you gotta look for other worms. That's mean, so just send them off, and, and you've got the gift of time, right? We'll see them in a week or two weeks or three weeks down the line. We're happy to see these cases. Send them our way. Also, you know, Canada, we don't have access to all the right drugs, believe it or not. These are the most commonly used drugs on the planet, but I have to beg the Canadian government to get an albendazole tablet, which you know, we give out like Halloween candy in other parts of the world. So sometimes it's important just to send them off to see us and we'll, we'll, we'll happily see your worms. Okay, skin infections. This slide is very purposeful. We show a lot of slides about skin infections. It's important to have multiple skin tones that are representative of the diversity of Canada. I'm trying very hard to ensure that we're inclusive in our, in our talks, and I've done my best for this talk. I gave, I, some of these slides you might, if you were here last year, you might recognize. I think it's important, just give me 30 seconds to highlight a few things that, were, that we chatted about last year. Skin infections are relatively easy. You think of them as purulent, or non-purulent, okay? Is there pus, yes or no? If it's non-purulent, it's strep. If it's purulent, it's staph. And if it's staph, it's either MSSA or MRSA. It really is that easy. If you think about it like that, you're gonna be right 95% of the time, okay? And it's easy to treat. Strep, non-purulent, use penicillin or cephalexin. Staph, squeeze the pus out. Give them septra or doxycycline because you're not sure that those will cover MRSA and MSSA as well. It really is that easy. It really is that easy. The problem is penicillin or cephalexin are four times a day drug. Who the hell takes a drug with any adherence four times a day for five days? No one. We know the adherence is terrible. There's better drugs for strep and for MSSA, and that better drug is a drug called cefadroxyl, and you can give that drug a gram a day, it works just fine, a gram a day. You can give it 500 milligrams twice a day and people will actually adhere to it. Some people are taking pictures, that's great. I'm glad you're learning this and it's really important and this is increasingly available. Some people are saying, yeah, 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 I know that, move along. So cefadroxyl is a wonderful drug for non-purulent cellulitis. It works, except when it doesn't. So when would you not use cefadroxyl for a non-purulent cellulitis? There's just a couple of things that we need to remember. One are bites, especially animal bites. Different animals have different flora, different bacterial flora in the mouth. Pastorella, might, you might remember your horror days from medical school, you associate that with cats, but believe it or not, about 50% of dogs have pastorella in their mouth as well. Cefadroxyl or cephalexin, it's not gonna work. You need a moxclav or a fluoroquinolone for bites, okay? Next one are puncture wounds, especially puncture wounds through shoes, okay? This person also probably needs a tetanus shot, but like, think about the bacteria that's gonna go on that nail from the environment through the shoe and into the foot. So yeah, you gotta cover skin infections, but that shoe is damp, that shoe is sweaty, that shoe is gross, and that shoe probably has pseudomonas in it. So often we add pseudomonal coverage in, uh, if you've got a puncture wound like that. Third one, that's Tiger Woods holding a lobster. 
Uh, I literally <laughs> Googled lobster, and that's the first picture that came up. So that's the only, I don't know anything about golf, but that's the first picture that came up. You were in warm tropical waters, and you've got a skin and soft tissue infection, you've got to cover for other, other bacteria that live in those waters. Vibrio is one of them, and you're going to use doxycycline or a fluoroquinolone uh, in, in those situations. So it's just important to recognize that, yes, for the vast majority of times, non-purulent cellulitis, you'll do just fine with cephalexin or cefadroxyl, but there are situations where that doesn't work. This is a skin and soft tissue infection of the hand, a non-purulent cellulitis of the hand. I don't have a laser, but you can sort of see at the bottom, that's probably the portal of entry on appropriate antibiotics, okay? On a, the cephalexin, not getting better, actually getting worse. Similar, uh, you can sort of see the portal of entry in the middle, cellulitis on appropriate antibiotics, on cephalexin, not getting better, actually getting worse. Is this a bug drug mismatch? Are we missing some important exposure? Did this person dip their leg in Lake Ontario or something like that and we're missing some aquatic infection? No, the exposure was this, polysporin, okay? Polysporin. There is a contact dermatitis that you can get from polysporin and other topical agents. It looks exactly like cellulitis. It will make it worse and if your, person, if your patient isn't getting better, you ask them if they're using a topical ointment on it, and if they are, tell them to stop it, and 99% of the time, it'll get better. This is a more severe manifestation that was published in CMAG a few years ago, but in general, it can look exactly like cellulitis, and you'll have a worsening cellulitis, even though you're on the appropriate antimicrobial therapy, so think about polysporin contact dermatitis. Finish up with this, uh, a dripping faucet. Okay, so we got a 27-year-old gentleman who is on HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. This is an incredible HIV prevention modality. People who are on this, are, you're seeing plummeting HIV uh, rates with HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's fantastic. I'm not here to talk about it, but if anyone wants to talk about it, please ask me. I love this, it's, it's, it's just brilliant. But this guy comes in with uh, urethral and rectal purulent discharge, okay? And you're doing everything right. You think, okay, it's drippy, it's probably gonorrhea, you screen him for you know, syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea. You screen him for HIV. Maybe he's not adherent to the uh, PrEP. You screen him for hepatitis C e in the eMERGE. You know those tests are going to come back later. You give the injection of ceftriaxone, the right dose, the right drug. That's going to cover your gonorrhea. You give him the gram of oral azithromycin. You're empirically covering this, this individual. Perfect. 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 Couldn't do it any better. Anything else? Are we missing anything? The answer is sort of an obnoxious and ID trick question, but the last thing is, is follow-up, okay? This guy's got gonorrhea. This guy for sure has gonorrhea, and with gonorrhea, you really need a test of cure. You absolutely need a test of cure. You do this three to seven days after treatment, or if you're using PCR, you do it about three weeks after completing therapy. But test of cure is extremely important because there's a lot of resistant gonorrhea out there, it's a growing problem. And you ask yourself, okay, you know what, I'm in the emergency department, how the hell am I gonna figure out where this person is gonna get a test of cure? You can't access a family doctor in Canada in 2023, like good luck with that. And the answer is actually a bit easier than you might think. There, I, I'm gonna be Ontario biased here, so apologies, I appreciate people are here from all over the place. But in Ontario, for example, there are plenty of sexual health clinics all over the place. There's plenty of public health clinics, free, uh, widely available, no referral necessary. You can go on the website and find them in one second. And I'm not just talking about downtown Toronto. I'm talking about Sault Ste. Marie, Thunder Bay, Timmins. Like these exist and these are available and they're not hard to find. You say, if you're not going to follow up with them, you can send this person for a follow up test uh, uh, to make sure that they have an appropriate test of cure. Gonorrhea is a problem. And, and, uh, and it's going to be a, an increasing problem. The United States is already using 500 milligrams IM. We're still using 250. But resistance is creeping in, and maybe in the near future we'll be using a higher dose. But there's actually strains out there where you can't treat. You can't treat with even ceftriaxone. And, you know, sadly, in our lifetime, we might be in a stage where you're going to have to admit people and give them intravenous antibiotics because of drug resistance. It's a problem, not entirely related to gonorrhea here, but just as a reminder, antibiotic resistance directly kills, not even indirectly, directly kills over a million people a year on the planet. There's unquantifiable morbidity related to this, and we're in big trouble. 
I'll, 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 I'll leave it on that positive note. So the take home points. Doxycycline and azithro are extraordinarily helpful for non-malarial, non-localizing fevers in travelers. Huge burden of dengue globally. Huge burden of typhoid in South Asia. Watch for it. Cephadroxyl is an extraordinarily helpful antibiotic, especially for non-purulent cellulitis. Beware the polysporin contact dermatitis. Gonorrhea requires a test of cure, and antimicrobial resistance is going to be an ongoing problem. And I'm going to stop exactly on time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, so we're going to give you guys a little break here.